Hello everyone, my name is Paul. Welcome to the Stormkeep. Today we are starting a new series called How to Counter Everything, episode number one. I'm joined today by my co-storm host. Signing in is James here. Hey, this is Mergonk. We are talking about Bellicor and the Legion of the First Prince today. Um, but let's uh, let's start with a little bit of introduction here. Uh, so How to Counter Everything is a new series we're going to be doing on the Stormkeep, and it will examine popular and powerful list archetypes in the metagame. Um, we are going to take a look at what makes them strong, what makes them popular, what they like to do. We're going to talk about um, what their weaknesses are, what their limitations are. And I think this is something that's going to be useful for people playing any army, not necessarily Stormcast. Although, obviously, we are going to take a look at it from a Stormcast point of view because we are the Stormkeep, after all. That's, that's the army we play. Um, at the end of the video, after discussing all the different units, their weaknesses and strengths, we're going to take a look at specific units that Stormcast can use to counter these lists. And the reason we started with Bellicor in particular, we've, we've had a lot of requests for uh, how to counter Lumineth, how to counter Seraphon, uh, but I wanted to start with Bellicor first because there is a winter update coming soon that should shake things up, but it's not going to change War Scroll and interactions in a, in a significant way, I don't think. It's probably going to change point costs here or there, and I'd rather wait until the, the meta settles before we do a video about Gargants or about Sentinels or um, you know quadruple Salamander teleporting squads. Those things are big threats, but uh, Bellicor seems more evergreen in the fact that if there are big changes to the game, it's not going to be rule changes that are going to break the core of this list. Uh, so what, mm -hmm. is, what, what is Bellicor and the Legion of the First Prince? Um, it, is, it is a control list. It's not your typical kind of list. It's not like Iron Jaws. Uh, that's going to try to run forward and kill everything on your side of the board and pin you in your deployment. It's not like Stormcast, which are going to double tap and delete your, your key pieces off the board first turn and then try to grind you out by before round three when you can counter them. Uh, this is a very specific kind of list that tries to just tie the opponent down, do damage in very specific places, and win through objective control and tactics. And it is not an intuitive army to play against because there are very, very many uh, really complex mechanics that this army has. And I feel like one of the reasons this list is so popular and so strong, uh, popular is not the right word. <laughs> it's not that popular. It's maybe like 5% of all uh, yeah, it's, finishes. It's, it's, it's very much played by uh, people who like typically who love playing control in like say Magic the Gathering. People who really love uh, using multiple mechanics and a combination of certain mechanics to just make the game as unfun as possible. This is not a straightforward Warhammer list by any means. Yeah, and, and it is becoming more popular for sure mm -hmm. um, because more, I, I think there's a certain kind of player that really enjoys this kind of like 200 IQ play where you're not trying to kill your opponent, but you are still trying to win. And mm -hmm. um, the, also the models are fantastic. Bellicor is, is a phenomenal model. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. are getting into it just for that reason. I think the worst model in that list is probably the Demon Prince. I think he's dated. Yeah, I was just going to say I'm excited to work on my Bellicor, quite frankly. Well, I'm excited to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the reasons I think this list is so successful is because people don't really know what it does or how it does it. Because, in part, the rules are buried across multiple novels and books and, and battle tones and things. Uh, Bellicor is, is enlisted in the Slaves to Darkness, but then he got an update in the uh broken realm broken series realms series and then i believe he also got in between there there was something in one of the campaign so books. his faction first got introduced in war of the ever chosen where osiar grand reapers attack archaeon that's and then the one it got updated to become legion of the first prince inside uh bellicor broken realms yeah and, and ever since its introduction it's had uh really really powerful strengths and the weaknesses are more or less irrelevant because the the specific units that this list uses um just really play into the strengths really well and because of the armies that are in the meta, it's still a very melee-focused game, even though we do have Seraphon, we do have Stormcast, we have Lumineth in the meta. It is more or less still a melee-focused game. And Bellicor and Legion of the First Prince thrive on just tar-pitting melee units until the game's over. Even, even when you do have a significant shooting, um, they can still just sit on objectives forever. So it's it has very few weaknesses, and I think the key to beating this particular list is to understand how these guys are trying to win, and what are the specific limitations that, that they're working with. So let's do a general overview of the Allegiance itself. It's Legion of the First Prince. It is from Broken Realms Bellicor, and it can use any demon unit except for Skaven and Everchosen. So you can't use Archaeon, you can't use um, the, the Grey Seers, you can't use any of that stuff. Uh, but that gives you a lot of different units to choose from. It gives you, uh, you know, Zinch, Korn, uh, Slanesh, I always forget the fourth one. 
Nurgle. Nurgle. God, how did I forget Nurgle? Yeah. We were just talking about it before we started. <laughs> um, so obviously it, it uses Bellicor, and if Bellicor's in your army, he can reroll hits if he's within range of uh, all four minor demons. So Plague Bearers, Demonettes, uh, Blood Letters, and Horrors. If you got all four of those near him, he can reroll all hits, which mm-hmm. in, in the previous edition, that wasn't a very strong ability uh, because there were other ways to reroll hits, specifically hit rolls of one. In third edition, rerolling hits is a premium, but you're not likely to activate this ability uh, because you're just not likely to have all four demon types around you. It seems more of like a a narrative yeah. fluffy kind of thing. Yep. Also, like I think hitting on twos, if they gave us hitting, if they gave him, if they give him hitting on twos with just all out attack, I, I feel like rerolling hits isn't that important. No, it's really not. Uh, it, it can be nice, but it's it's not you know it's not a scary part of the list. Um, yeah. Minor demons though can bodyguard for Bellacor. So on a four up, if there's a minor demon, which are the four that I listed before, I'm going to keep referring to them as minor demons because it comes up a few times. Um, if they're near Bellacor when he takes a wound on a four up, they take it instead, which is very strong. It's one of the stronger bodyguard abilities in the game, especially given I, how the range on that is, is uh, incredible because most bodyguard abilities in the game are within three inches. Yeah, this guy bodyguards. Anything, not wholly within, just within 18. Yeah, it, it's a tremendously wide ability. Like, if he totally flies past his horrors, he'll still be in range to to get their bodyguard if they just make a run move up. It's pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cursed Skies, uh, at the end of each turn, they can heal slain models, which means if you don't fully wipe out a unit of horrors, it will get a horror back. Um, thankfully, they have issued an errata so that when you split, you're not actually slain, which is very good. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. The brimstones do count as slain, but the the pink and blue do not. We'll we'll get into that later when we talk about horrors. Uh, the Infernal Realm Walker's ability is an army wide six plus ward, which is very strong, especially when you apply it to units like horrors, which typically don't have a ward, and now they do. So they're effectively getting a twenty okay. percent increase to their effective health, which is crazy on a unit like that. So they're sixty wounds now. <laughs> effectively Infer- sixty wounds all the time. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, Unyielding Legions is a summoning ability. At the end of each movement phase, you can pick a hero. Depending on which kind of hero you pick, you can summon a different unit. And if you roll three dice, and on a 10+, plus, you summon an additional minor demon unit. Now, I believe there's also a failure chance for this ability, where Mm -hmm. if you roll doubles or something, um, you know... Yeah, you take take mortal wounds. Yeah, I always assume my opponent is going to summon. Like, I assume the worst-case scenario for myself. So just make the assumption that your opponent will make that roll every single turn, and they're going to add a unit of horrors or furies to the table. That's a good way to assume, because if anything else becomes a bonus for you. Mm-hmm. And the, the three main enhancements, they're going to be running. Almost every single list will run these three. Uh, the spell, you put that on a unit, and that unit can fight when it gets slain in melee, which normally isn't that scary on a unit of horrors, uh, but it's just about the volume of dice with them. So mm-hmm. watch out for that one. It might not be worth uh, using a Dispel Scroll on, for example. You might value getting rid of Mystic Shield more, or um, what's the Cairo spell called? Gift of Change? Yeah, uh, Kyra spell. Yeah, uh, gift of change. Yes, yeah. Six mortal wounds, create a spawn one. Yep. Yeah, that's definitely worth using an unbind scroll, but just pay attention for the spell because it could catch you off guard and and you might lose a unit to it. I would say just get rid of spell portal because that that's thing a is, big one, yeah. I think ranged eighteen. You get oh, rid yeah. of that. You don't have to worry about the spell at all. Oh yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, the command trait that this army always takes is you add one to the ward save for units that are wholly within eight inches. So that's a 5-up ward for the whole army, and as Stormcast players, we know how strong 5-up ward auras are. This one is only 8 inches, and it is wholly within, so it is a little bit more limited. Uh, usually it is on bigger based models, though. So it's about it's it's like having a Gardas in your army. It's very important. And the ar- the artifact that they take is uh, allows them to reroll save rolls against melee attackers. So it, just leaning heavier into this uh, anti-melee list archetype that we got here. Uh, you can mm-hmm. see the typical units that they use are obviously Bellacor. Uh, they use a Demon Prince. So, Go ahead. Um, I would say the artifact is actually the one that triggers mortal wounds on the fives. Um, you think so? I've seen I a just... lot of lists. Yeah, because uh, typically what they they like to do, I mean, Reroll Sailor versus Melee is, yeah, like that is certainly a build. Um, and we're going to discuss this later, but uh, the build that goes for uh, the Bloodthirster, uh, they definitely want that mortal wound artifact. Okay, fair enough. I, I'm used to, to seeing people run the Armor of the Pact because they the re-rolling saves right now is very, very good. Really strong mm-hmm. ability, especially when, when uh, your Demon Prince is a 3-up save, which means you can buff him to a 2-up, and then you can make him re-roll that. It's really, really tanky. Yeah. So we can definitely talk about that other artifact. I haven't seen it as much. Mm-hmm. 
It so, used to be really popular on a Berman Lord, but yeah, go on. Yeah, you can't use Berman Lords anymore though. Yep. That was axed. It used to be the case you could run those guys, and that was that was stupid. Yeah, <laughs> agree. So typical units in a Bellicor list. Obviously, you've got Bellicor. Uh, you have a Demon Prince, and they almost always have the Corn keyword. And we'll get into the reason why they have that later. Uh, it will have Kairos Fate Weaver, a special character from Zinch. It'll have the Pink Scribes, which are another special character from Zinch. And it has the Contorted Epitome, which is from Slanesh. And it'll definitely have Pink Horrors. If you're if you're facing a list without Pink Horrors, you're going to have a much easier time. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about Bellicor first. So he got a really big glow up in Broken Realms. He is uh, a lot tankier, and he does more damage. He costs a lot more points. Uh, but he is he's just a great model now. So he's fast, right? 14-inch flying move. He's durable, 14 wounds and a 4-up save. 4-up uh, save isn't that great these days, uh, but if you look at the next ability there, it's the Shadow Form. He ignores all modifiers, positive and negative, when making save rolls. So all your Ren 2 attacks mean nothing to him. But on the flip side, he also can't benefit from all that Defense or Mystic Shield or Finest Hour. Crossbows. Yep, crossbows, crossbows yeah. are good against him. Yep, any Ren Zero attacks, high volume can generally take him down. Uh, you only have to deal about 28 shots, and then you know he, he'd fail half of them and die. Well, he's got the ward too, but it, math, anyway. Um, mm-hmm. Generally, um, he's he has no range damage, but he has some pretty good melee attacks. Uh, he does less damage than something like two Fulminators, so it's not that yes. scary. Like you can you can maybe tank him with a unit of liberators for a turn if you get lucky. Uh, he's, mm-hmm. His damage isn't so high that you should you know put a, a lot of resources in defending against it. But you also can't ignore him. He will cut through some pieces and allow just board space. Uh, he is a two spell wizard. I don't think he has any bonuses to cast. Let me. I don't think. No, he doesn't. Yeah, that's you know he's I not the, the best. The thing, other thing on his war scroll is he just makes uh, more things flee basically. Yeah. yeah. Something flees around him. Yeah. Uh, His signature spell does cause a unit to have minus one to wound with melee weapons specifically. So again, leaning into this anti-melee theme. Uh, But the most important ability on his War Scroll by far is the Dark Master. This is an ability so strong that people would take Bellicor uh, just as an allied unit in any chaos list that they could because of this ability. With an increased point cost, that strategy is not as useful as it was before. But uh, yeah, so let's talk about the Dark Master. So what this ability does is at the start of the enemy hero phase, which is your turn, the the enemy player, that's you, uh, Bellicor picks one unit. And that unit, every time it tries to do a specific kind of action, which is listed here, on a 3+, plus, it just can't do that action. So if you try to move, you roll a dice, 3+, plus, you can't do it. You try to shoot, 3+, plus, you can't do it. You try to cast a spell, 3+, plus, you can't do it. This is a very strong ability in the meta that we're currently in because we're focused on really impactful single units. There's not too many units that are all about like five or 10 key units that are all trying to do their own thing. Lists are typically running, here's my big block of Sentinels, here's my block of Raptors, here's Lord Croak when he was relevant, Um, here's my Gargant that's charging forwards. Like he can shut down each one of those units, potentially on a three plus. Mm -hmm. It is only once per game and it lasts from the start of your turn as the enemy to the start of Bellicor's turn. And there's a lot of peculiarity in there. So we can we, we can talk about the minutia there in a second. Um, it should be worth noting that there's very specific actions that this ability uh, disallows. So that is charging, shooting, fighting commands, um, chanting prayers, casting spells, dispelling, unbinding spells. Unbinding is a little weird. I, I'm not sure why they included that. Because if it's used in your turn, you're not unbinding spells in your own turn. Which, that's a... You know, maybe for multiplayer games, I guess? Uh, maybe, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know why I'd buy it, but sure, why not? It, it's quite peculiar, but, you know, yeah. could be a remnant of uh, some other design they had in mind. So the next next most common unit you'll see in these lists is a Demon Prince of Corn, And the Demon Prince is usually the general, and, and he, as the general, will carry the 5-plus ward aura, which, again, is wholly within 8 inches of him. He is also fast. He's a 12-inch flying move. He can't run in charge. Bellicor also can't run in charge. None of these guys can retreat in charge. So they're they're fast, but they're not mobile. You know, they can't redeploy out of it. Once they get somewhere, that's where they're stuck for a while. He is also very durable. Despite being only 8 wounds and a 3-up save, uh, because he's less than 10 wounds, unlike Bellicor, he can benefit from cover and lookout, sir, which makes it harder to snipe him down. And you can stack save bonuses on him if you're worried about him getting sniped down. And he will always have a 5-up board, so he's effectively 12 wounds 
uh, which can easily get a whole bunch of save bonuses. And like I said, mm -hmm. he'll usually have the artifact to reroll save rolls, uh, but Morgonk, you're saying uh, he, he might have a different one, or, or the Bloodthirster might have that one. Yep. So this guy, unlike Bellicor, is not a monster. Um, similar to Bellicor, he's not the biggest beat stick in melee. You can pretty much ignore his melee attacks. Like, if he's charging into melee with you, that's great, because then you can just kill him, and that's a big pain off your off your butt. Uh, the most important ability on this guy's War Scroll is the Blood Slick Ground Command ability. So how this works is uh, it halves your run and charge rolls um, if you're within 18 inches of him. There's a little bit of controversy about this ability and how it's specifically worded. Uh, the way I interpret this ability is that it, it pulses and it checks which units are within range when he uses the ability, and then it lasts on them until the next hero phase. And uh, a lot of people play this ability as an aura, which is a constant effect that checks every single time a unit moves within range, it applies the ability. I don't think that's the correct way to play this ability, uh, because if you look only a couple pages down from this guy, there's another uh, War Scroll, the Dark Oath War Queen. She has an ability that also affects charge rolls, but it requires checking the distance to her when the charge roll is made. So it's a very... I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here on this one. Um, I personally view it one way if people play it another way that's fine too um but I, I feel like that's an incorrect interpretation i think the ability definitely deserves an faq a lot of abilities are worded in this kind of ambiguous way is it an aura or is it a pulse we don't know um, until mm -hmm. then i would just talk to your opponent or talk to a tournament organizer ahead of time see how they were going to rule it and play it you can play around I yeah, this thing is everyone's just been playing it as an aura all this time it'll be really hard to convince someone to not do that yeah, and, and, or Theo for that matter, because it's it's like it's it's not that I don't think you're incorrect. It's just, uh, sorry, not that I think you're incorrect, but it's just it's sort of like the prevailing way how people play this. It's what makes it so strong. Yeah, I think it makes it weaker if you if you can be out of range of it when he activates it, and then walk in normally. Um, if it's the other way, I think you know that's such an incredibly strong ability. It, it borders on oppressive, especially in a game with redeploy. It, it just becomes really really difficult to make any charges. Because um, if you picture your... You know, I can't believe it's 18. That's way too big. If it was like 7 yeah. or 9, that'd be fine. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge range on the ability. Uh, it, it's really, really strong. I, I Like I said, talk to your opponent, talk to your tournament organizer, see how they would rule it. i um, not going to make a big deal about this one. I've played it both ways, and I'm still able to beat this list. So it's not, it's not the thing that's going to hold you back. But that is definitely the most important ability on his War Scroll, the ability to reduce your charges in half. Because if you think about it, if you're uh, walking up a unit of, let's say, 10-inch Fulminators, and they redeploy back 5 inches, and you have a half charge move, that's that's a tough charge to make. Think about Annihilators. <laughs> oh, yeah. Annihilators just get screwed. You have to roll mm -hmm. uh, 7 on one on one dice effectively. <laughs> yeah. can't can't Not going to happen. Yep. Really, really difficult to make that work. So the next most popular, so I would put um, Bellicor, the Demon Prince, and Kairos. Those are the core units. You will see them in every single Legion of the First Prince list. Uh, Kairos, the reason he's included um, is because of his Oracle of Eternity ability, which we'll get to later. Uh, but let's go over the stats again here. He is also fast flying, 12-inch flying move. He's relatively durable. I wouldn't call him that durable. He has 14 wounds, only a 4-up save. He can't get lookout, sir, or cover. Um, but he can stack save bonuses like their finest hour and all at defense. Mm -hmm. uh, he will probably be standing near the Corn Demon Prince, so he will get that 5-up ward because he needs to stay alive against any kind of shooting. And so that means on average you'll have to deal about 21 wounds to kill him through the ward. Kairos doesn't have any missile weapons, and he's not a very big threat in melee, uh, but what he does do is he's a very good wizard. He's an, he's an excellent wizard. Uh, he casts with three spells. He casts very reliably because he can change the lowest dice roll to match the highest dice roll. So if you roll a, a five and a one, that one becomes a five, and now you've rolled a ten, which is really insane. Most of the time, their spells will be going off in, like, tens. Yes, it's really, really, really hard to shut down his casting. Uh, and he also, you know, as a note, he learns the spells of any friendly wizards wholly within 18 inches. So if, if one of the wizards in this army has a really powerful spell and you're trying to stay out of range of it, just remember that Kairos is probably also going to know that spell. Uh, the, most, the most important ability on the War Scroll is definitely Gift of Change. That's not the reason he's necessarily run. Gift of Change is very strong. I think Oracle of Eternity is the main reason people run Kairos. Uh, but the thing we care about at Stormcast the most is Gift of Change. So what that spell does is it just does six mortal wounds. And if it kills something, then you set up a chaos spawn 
within three inches of the unit that just lost a model, which is huge. Yep. That's a huge distinction. Normally abilities that spawn things have to be, you know, more than nine or more than 12 away, but this spawns it specifically within three inches of that slain model's unit. So you just tie down an enemy army. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So an enemy shooting unit uh, that doesn't have anything nearby to help kill off the, the, the chaos spawn in the same turn, they're going to be stuck in combat with this worthless little spawn and they won't be able to shoot out of combat anymore. It's a great way to shut down Lumineth and uh, Stormcast and Seraphon armies. Now this ability, this spell only has an 18 inch range and he doesn't have any kind of teleporting or, or deep striking or anything like that. And it does require line of sight. But to get around this, they always have a spell portal. If you see a Legion of the First Prince list without a spell portal, you're going to have a great time. I'd say you, you take Kairos. Any, any list that has Kairos in it has a spell portal in it. Absolutely. And he very reliably cast that, and then he very reliably cast Gift of Change. It is worth noting, though, Gift of Change does get weaker if you bracket him. So if you reduce him down to half health, you're dealing with a much weaker uh, Gift of Change. It's not just a guaranteed six portal wounds anymore. Uh, now, mm -hmm. do keep in mind that he can use Heroic Recovery before he casts spells. So... Just because you bracketed him once, he might just heal back up. So you might want to make sure he's he's going to stay bracketed. And the second most important ability on the War Scroll is the Oracle of Eternity. It's another one of these once-per-game abilities. And what it does is it replaces a dice roll with a result of your choosing. Now, this specifically says it replaces one dice in a 2d6 roll. So you can't just replace both dice in a charge roll or in a casting roll. You can replace one. So if you get a 6 and a 1... They can replace the six with another one and you fail your charge. So it's a very strong ability, especially when you combine it with the blood slick ground that's also reducing your charges. Right. Um, is there a reason you said can still be unbound? Yes, because the Knight Cantor's ability, uh, the, the Void Storm, void storm scroll? scroll? Yeah, something like that. It, uh, it says instead of rolling. So the Oracle of Eternity oh, okay, okay. cannot be used on that to, to stop a Knight and Cantor from unbinding a spell. Mm-hmm. So if your opponent tries to pull that with you, be like, no, no, no. I watch the Stormkeep. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's a few more miscellaneous that are that are pretty popular. I think um, the Blue Scribes definitely make the cut a lot of times because Kairos is a, is a single Zine Shiro, and typically you want a second Zine Shiro somewhere in the list so that you can continue spawning horrors in case Kairos dies or isn't in range or something. Uh, but the Blue Scribes, they're not... They're not that key to the success of this army. They're, you know, they're fast. They're a fast flying hero. Um, they're super fragile, though. They're only five wounds on a five up save. They have almost no damage output. They're not a monster, so they can't score tactics easily. They're they're really just there to be an extra wizard and to summon horrors. The yeah. real casting helps because Belakor, I believe. No, Belakor doesn't have the Zinch keyword. Never mind. He does not. No, it's mo it's mostly there for um, helping to make sure that Kairos goes off because as we'll talk about in the strength section and what their game plan is, Kairos is a big part of why this list is successful. You need to make sure Gift of Change goes off. So being able to re-roll it is, is an important ability. Being able to re-roll those double ones, yeah, definitely. Another piece you'll see in this list sometimes is the Contorted Epitome. This is uh, The main reason for this is their horrible fascination ability, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but they are fast. You know, they're, they're pretty fragile. Seven wounds, but five up save. They do have a two-up ward against mortals, which is kind of cool, but five up save and seven wounds, they're pretty fragile. Uh, yeah. They are they are a two-spell wizard, and they get to reroll all casting rolls. So this army very reliably casts pretty much whatever spell they want. Uh, their signature spell allows the whole army to reroll hit rolls of one against D3 units in range of this of this thing, which is a very strong ability. Rerolling hit rolls of one is a premium ability these days. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the most the most important ability is horrible fascination. So how this works is at the start of the combat phase, you roll one dice for each enemy unit within three inches of the epitome. And on a four plus, that unit cannot target the epitome with melee attacks. So what happens is if you charge the epitome with a big unit of fulminators, at the start of the combat phase, they roll a five and your fulminators have to activate, but they can't target the epitome. So you just sit there and do nothing. Your, your activation mm -hmm. is wasted and then the epitome gets to fight back and not take any damage in return. So this thing is not going to be your highest target. But what they're going to do is they're going to stick it on the front line. They're going to make it as difficult as possible to charge it between Oracle of Eternity and Bloodslick Ground. And then if you do charge it, they're still going to hope for a four up so that you just can't fight it at all. Yep. Excellent, like, target utility, really. Yes. Especially when they're re-rolling Mystic Shield, 
they have a ward save against uh, mortal wounds. They're they're mortal a nice wounds. utility yeah. piece. Yeah. And okay. they also allow you to summon in some uh, demonettes. They're a slanesh hero, unlike the zine heroes we've seen so far. This would be the guys that allow you to summon in demonettes if you want them for some reason. And let's talk about horrors. My favorite unit in the entire game. I love horrors so much. Not to lie. They're okay. the best. They're the bestest <laughs> unit ever. I love talking about them. Uh, so horrors have always been a problem child in this game. And they just recently got a new War Scroll in the Disciples of Zine Charada in August 2021 when they updated everything for 3rd edition. Um, pink Horrors are very slow and they are fragile in, in, a, in a sense. Um, they are a 6-up save and a 6-up ward. They can add one to save rolls while the musician is alive. And they have a 5-up ward if they're within range of the general like everything else in this army. And their damage is basically nothing. It's just a, it's a bucket of dice that has no rend and it's not the reason you're worried about this unit. It's just a tar pit unit that is meant to waste your time. And that's a big deal in this game because not many units can do this anymore. So split and split again is how these things are so annoying. The unit starts with 10 pink horrors. Every time you kill a pink horror, it is replaced by two blue horrors. And every time a blue horror dies, it's replaced by a brimstone horror, right? Those replacement mm -hmm. models have to be within one inch of the model they're replacing. So you can't just conga line out all the way to capture objectives like you could with the older war scrolls and summoning rules and uh, they can only be set up within three inches of an enemy unit if you're already within three inches of an enemy unit and there's more restrictions on this the pink horrors all have to die before any blue horrors can die and then all the blue horrors have to die before any brimstone horrors can die so in total you have to kill 50 wounds worth of horrors what started out as 10 models with 10 wounds turns into 50 models with 50 wounds in total all of which are going to have a 6-up or a 5-up ward. Mm -hmm. And it gets better because the pink and blue guys don't actually count as slain when they split, which means they don't count towards battle shock results. Only the Brimstone oh, the rally. That's right. It's a double-edged sword. They can't be rallied back. Um, however, it is worth mentioning that if, if you kill them with an instant kill effect, then they are actually slain. The only way they split is if you deal damage to them, a wound or a mortal wound. So if you have something like a Star Drake chomping one of them to death instantly, then it's actually slain and it can come back to life later. Uh, so, that's important, but I can't really think of that many. There, there's not that many instant slain effects in the game anymore, uh, but mm -hmm. Stormcast have two, so they're worth talking about. <laughs> sure. Uh, so this is just a unit of 10 pink horrors. And remember that as a battle line unit, these guys can be reinforced and then double reinforced. So you could have a version of this list eventually that's dealing with 30 pink horrors that are effectively 150 wounds with a 5-up ward. That becomes <laughs> 225 wounds that you have to chew through for only, I believe, 600 points or around there. Yes, uh, they're like, I believe, I want to say they're 220. So yeah, like 660 or something. It's that's a stupid amount of wounds. It is really, really hard to chew <laughs> through that. That's twice of what most armies can bring to the table. Stupid amount of models to pain. Yeah. Contrast, wow. man. Just like slap Volupius pink, slap the Ultramarines blue, slap the Griffon orange, done. I would just dip the model. I wouldn't even like necessarily paint it. Yeah, just turbo paint all the way. Mm -hmm. Use that fancy new airbrush of yours. Yes, sir. So there's a few other units that uh, Legion of the First Prince list might use. I'd say the most important one is probably the Bloodthirster, uh, usually the Insensate Rage version of it. He, When they run him, they tend to run him as the general instead of the Demon Prince of Corn. Uh, this makes the this guy a bigger target, I would say, especially if you're a shooting-based army. He has a bigger base. He's 14 wounds and a 4-up save instead of a 3-up. So, you know, in this game, 8 wounds on a 3-up on a is about the same as 14 wounds on a 4-up, just because of how good save stacking is. So they're about the same durability. He has a much bigger target, though. He can't hide. He can't get lookout serve. So I would say arguably easier to kill. And he's, also, mm -hmm. he's also slower, which is weird. He's only a 10-inch flying move. Um, but the reason you're worried about this guy... Uh, he has a bigger base, so you get a bigger ward save aura, because holy within 8 inches of a, of a huge base is a bigger deal. Um, but the main reason people run him is because Kairos has that ability to guarantee any roll in the game. And if this guy gets a wound roll of 6, then all enemy units within 8 inches of him take 4 mortal wounds. Which is huge. It's an explosive amount of damage. Like, if you get, if you get a natural roll of a 6, and then Kairos uses his, his ability to get another roll of a 6, everything, oh, yeah. and, everything just explodes. Yeah. Especially like, Stormcast Castle Formations, like, oof. Yeah, it's like getting hit by three Everblaze comments at the same time. It's crazy. So to counter that, 
you just have to be you know a little bit more than eight inches from the front line with anything that actually matters this list cannot tear down screens that's a very big weakness of legion first prints is they have no ability to reach out and kill your chaff units so if you just put stuff in the way and keep your important things 8.1 inches away you can unleash hell and and bracket this thing and not take any damage from any kind of gimmick so try to shoot him down before he gets in melee uh, i think the best versions of the Legion of First Prince will not use the Bloodthirster because he's a very aggressive unit in an army that doesn't want to be aggressive. So he kind of he gets thrown out there and then he dies is usually what I see happen with this guy. Some versions will run Flesh Hounds. They're faster chaff than the Pink Horrors. They get a free charge reroll, so a little bit more mobility. It's not a, a significant increase in mobility. It can unbind, and if they're near a Corn Hero, they can reroll the unbind. So. Yeah, they don't do much damage. They're pretty fragile, but they are faster than something like Plague Bearers. Uh, Plague Bearers are recently updated in the Magikin book. They're still slow. They still do basically zero damage, uh, but they are a durable battle line unit that is good for just hanging back, denying space, holding objectives. You don't really care what they mm -hmm. do. You get your points out of it because if your opponent tries to kill them, great. If not, you know, battle line slot is filled. You know, that's good enough. Now, Furies are, are definitely worth a mention. Uh, they are fast, so unlike unlike these other units we've talked about, these guys are are you know capable of doing some sneaky things. They don't really do damage. They don't have a save at all. They just die. Uh, but they have this really cool ability called Sneaky Little Devils, where instead of fighting, when it's their turn to fight, they make a retreat move. And with their 12-inch flying move, they can steal objectives from from you. They can charge in and then not fight you and just leap over you and steal your objective. Mm -hmm. So, well, that and uh, they make some excellent like uh, chaff in case like you're building, you're not going all in on horrors. Mm -hmm. And and Bellicor is able to summon these guys. So always watch mm -hmm. out for the for the nine inch summon followed by, or, or sorry, the greater than nine inch summon followed by Oracle of Eternity guaranteeing a charge, almost guaranteeing. It's not a guarantee, but it's it's pretty close. And then uh, using the retreat ability to just jump behind an objective. It's so one of the little tricks this list can pull off that catches people unaware, and sometimes it's the, you know, the extra couple of victory points you need to win. So let's talk about yeah. the strengths of this list. So we've talked about all the key units, uh, but let's talk about how we put that all together. So as I mentioned earlier, it is a magic and melee control list, and it has a lot of hero monsters for battle tactics. You've got your Demon Prince, you've got Bellicor, Kairos. Those three guys can just run in a triangle, and boom, there's two victory points any turn you want them. Um, mm -hmm. You have to be able to kill the heroes to cripple this list, and that's very difficult to do when they're all surrounded by pink horrors and they're summoning more horrors every turn, and they are fairly durable for what they're doing. Uh, and yeah. they all get the five up ward, more or less, because they're going to play pretty tight usually. It's and, basically that. Like You would think that a list built around demons who aren't really that good would be good, but it's that five up ward, man. It's so good. Yeah. As a, as a, just as a general aura, good lord. Yep, especially when you combine it with Bellicor using Dark Master sh to more or less reliably shut down one important thing per turn. Mm -hmm. When you combine that with the five up ward and and the heroic recoveries and the finest hour and the mystic shields and it, it's a durable army. Yeah. If you're all melee, you're gonna have a very very tough time playing against this. Like this list completely crushes Iron Jaws. It crushes Soul Blight. It crushes um, any melee focused army really. If you don't have significant shooting or or the ability to just reach out and do damage beyond pink horrors, you're gonna have a tough time against this. Mm -hmm. So Bellicor himself is durable, um, especially because he's bodyguarding into horrors, which just split into more horrors, which actually makes them better than if they were just pink horrors. Uh, the Demon yeah. Prince of Corn has excellent melee utility, anti melee utility, and he is fairly durable himself. There's lots of durable chaff in in pink horrors and plague bearers. Um, so just to do the math here, like we said before, 10 horrors are 50 wounds, and it's always like minimum 10, sometimes 20 models to sit on objectives. And that's assuming mm -hmm. they're not reinforced, which is nuts. Oh, um, yeah, that's the horror scenario. I think I think a lot of lists will at least bring 20 pink horrors just to have that giant target. Yes, not many armies can do you know 100 and, 140 wounds or 125 mm -hmm. wounds or whatever it is. It's nuts. Uh, 10 Plague Bearers recently updated. They're 20 wounds with a minus one to be hit by missile weapons. They don't have their native 5-up ward. That's been moved to an Allegiance ability, but they will still have a 6-up ward. And minus one to hit with missile weapons is a really good ability these days. Yep. Uh, so expect to deal with more and more horrors as the game goes on. They're, Like I said, expect your opponent to make that roll every single time. So they're going to add 5 units of horrors in the first 5 turns of the game. 
A big thing this list does is all about the hero phase magic control. So Kairos does really good casting, he's very reliable, and he also unbinds all of your spells as well because uh, he, he gets great bonuses to that. Um, his ranged mortal wounds are the core of this list. Without it, I don't think this list would function because it would just be a slow melee army. But with Kairos in there, the control added It's almost on top like of, they have shooting. Yeah, yes. It's, it's like they have some mortal wound shooting. Yeah, imagine you're playing against a list that has like a couple Knight Judicators, right? That's what Kairos mm -hmm. is. He's just going to ping a key unit every single turn uh, very reliably. That can't be blocked with line of sight for the most part because of how Spell Portal usually works. Um, mm -hmm. So they rely on that Gift of Change to kill your support heroes outright and then to drop a Chaos Spawn in range of some shooting unit that you can tie down for a turn. Or even your support heroes. like like a If you have squishy 5-up five, five save, 5 wound support heroes in the back, uh, the spawn will go for them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it can it can still kill them. Yeah, I talked about it being negligible, but it can kill support heroes for sure. And yeah, I want to say the control spells are also pretty relevant because since Kairos knows the spells of any friendly wizards, there's a really good spell called Enfeeble Foe, which is on Bellicor. Uh, that's a Prax one from Wound Rolls, which is a really good debuff to have in the game. Yeah, you can Dark Master one unit, you can Enfeeble the other unit, and then you can Oracle of Eternity a third unit. This list can shut down multiple threats every turn while adding more and more bodies every single turn. So that's what makes this list good. Let's talk about the very specific weaknesses and limitations that this has. Um, this is a control list. It's not trying to kill you. It's trying to win through tar pitting you and sniping off key units with Gift of Change. Aside from Gift of Change, there's no range damage in this list, right? So if you're playing against a, a, a Lumineth Castle formation, this list does very poorly against that particular archetype because the Lumineth Sentinels kill Kairos and then they just take their time picking apart units and capturing objectives as they need it. Um, mm -hmm. it. The list, like I said, it has good movement because they have a bunch of 12-inch flying move, but it doesn't have good mobility. They can't uh, deep strike, they can't run and charge, they can't retreat and charge, they can't teleport. Uh, wherever they're going, it's very telegraphed, and they're going to be stuck there. So they have to be yeah. very careful about where they go, and if you put roadblocks in the way, they don't really have the mobility to get past you. Uh, they can't put anything in reserve, which means any kind of shooting is going to be very, very powerful, especially a very powerful early game shooting like Thunderbolt Volley from Stormcast or Karadron dropping in with their party Zeppelin uh, or Seraphon dropping in with uh, a bunch of Salamanders. This stuff is, is very good against this kind of list. Um, low damage across the board as well. Horrors don't do damage. Bellicor doesn't do damage. Um, Demon Prince doesn't really do damage. The Bloodthirster can be stopped. Like There's nothing in this list that is as scary as like four fulminators charging at you. You know, you don't have to you don't have to put that much effort into screening. Like minimum screening is all you need to take to shut this list down. But that's fine because they're not trying to kill you. They're trying to yeah, just slow you they're, down. They're trying to just gum up the board and then win through slow attrition because if Kairos is just killing you with mortal wounds and then Bellacor is putting in some melee work you know, because he's pretty much safe considering all the demons. And then the more pinks you kill, you actually make your objective taking capability worse, you know, unless yep. you're Gargans. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's how they win. You, you have to kill the pink horrors in one turn. Otherwise, they become a bigger problem than when you started. If you get halfway through killing them, uh, you're just mm -hmm. going to make your life harder because now there's more models than there were before. Yeah. And that actually sucks because if, when you, if you start to, so don't like, and we'll go into like how to deal with this list, but people who try to kill Bellacor because, you know, they it's a big, monster on a big base or something you're actually making the game worse because he'll just pass the wound onto pink horrors and then they'll count as more models on objectives <laughs> yes yep you're helping him out when you try to kill the Hor when you try to kill bellicor uh, it's generally not worth trying to snipe him uh, it is a hero hammer list which means uh it can never be a one drop because there's too many heroes right you can't fill enough those commander slots go quick and you mm. can't uh you can't do a battle regiment so this list will always be weak to alpha strikes um, or not weak, but it will be vulnerable to Alpha Strike. Vulnerable to it, yep. Yeah. It, uh, if you can attack before the Demon Prince activates his Blood Slick Ground, then they are being forced to use things like Oracle of Eternity to shut down your charges. They're being forced to use the Dark Master early, which they don't want to do. They generally want to wait until round two or three when they can take a big swing turn. Um, yeah, none of their units can go in Heart Hunters of the Heartland, which means they're vulnerable to monstrous rampages. So if you're an Iron Jaws player and you love stomping on things, then you're going to have a great time against this army. They can put horrors in there, but I mean the heroes, the stuff you actually want to kill, you want to stomp on that. Oh, they, no, you can't stomp the monsters, though. You not the monsters. The demon prince. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he's not a monster. Yeah, you can stomp him, which is a which is a good thing to do because he's a he's a high armor target. So, yep. 
Uh, they start with few bodies and few units. If, if you're a Stormcast player, you will be familiar with this, that you'll have maybe six units on the board that are capable of doing things. You don't have a lot of spare stuff, right? And, and this list very much suffers from that as well. Everything has an important purpose. Uh, they don't have extra units that they can have off doing any, any extra chores that they need to do, right? Uh, they will summon more throughout the game, but the start of the game, they're at their weakest. So this list combined with the fact that they can't be one drop is at its weakest uh, at the top of round one before anything happens and another thing worth noting is that the the ward from the general is actually a pretty small range wholly within eight inches this is one of the reasons i, I mentioned people run the bloodthirster instead is because it makes the aura bigger you can fit more stuff in there it's easier to fit kairos in there and behind scenery and things like that but that is a, a limitation you can definitely play around you can try to you know, pull them apart from two different sides. You can try to force Bellacor one way and try to force a Demon Prince the other way and then close the trap on one of them. And the Dark Master in particular has a lot of limitations. It does not stop you from using any abilities on your War Scroll. So if you have something that, uh, you know, an, an ability that pick a unit, it takes D3 Mortal Wounds or something. It doesn't stop that. Yeah, it only stops command abilities, yep. Yes. Uh, it also has to be declared at the start of the hero phase, which gives you time to plan your turn afterwards. So typically how this would go is you would you would pick your battle tactic, you would pick uh, your heroic action, they would do the same, and then they would activate the Dark Master. And that lets you know uh, what you're going to do. So for they, they have to pick the heroic action, they have to pick the Dark Master target. So you can hold off. If you have a, a big Thunderbolt volley that you know you can unleash, if they don't declare that they're using Dark Master, you're good to go. If they do use it, okay, you pivot, you do something else, right? So there is one more important caveat. It's the start of the enemy hero phase. That's right. He can't, yeah, he can't just lock something down on his turn and like, like let's say you have a great unbinder like Teplis or the Night Encanter. He can't just lock that down and be like, okay, my Karos will get to do whatever he wants. Yeah, which yeah. did happen to me at the Austin Open, and I talked to my friend. And he laughed about it. He's like, yeah, sorry about that. I didn't, I didn't read it carefully enough. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, a lot of people who play the army get this wrong. But this is a very the particular nuance of how this ability works is, is one of the most important things to understand. It also requires picking a unit on the battlefield, which means if you have units in Scions or some other kind of reserve, then they can't pick that unit. So you can deep strike shoot this army all day long. Another important thing is that this is just once per game. The Dark Master seems like this really scary ability, but if you can bait it out, then and and remember, it can still fail, right? It has to activate on a three plus. So mm -hmm. even if he does use it. A one in three chance is better than nothing. So still, you might still want to go for it if, uh, if he does try to shut down one of your units. I wouldn't plan a whole turn around it, but um, if you have a big, if he shuts down a big unit of Raptors or something, you can still maybe get some value out of it. Yeah. So how do we counter Bellacore? <laughs> the answer: use a gun. <laughs> and if that don't work, use more. Use gun. more gun. <laughs> <laughs> so. The type of Legion of the First Prince army, th this particular type we're talking about anyway, because I'm sure people will build it in different ways, but this is the one that we see at tournaments that does really well. Uh, it's meant to do well against melee armies because it does well against Ugargans, it does well against Iron Jaws, it does well against Lumineth, um, Daughters of Cain before they started swapping to shooting, it does well against Ideneth, it does well against these melee armies. And shooting is still not as prevalent uh, in the tournament meta in Age of Sigmar as I think it ought to be. Uh, Anti-magic is somewhat common, but this list has such good magic that it doesn't really matter. And other control armies uh, don't have the bodies to compete with these guys getting onto objectives first. So putting all these pieces together, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, if you play a Stormcast army, here's our advice. Kairos is the number one threat. He has a very high threat range if he has the spell portal. Um, you can deploy your units within 30 inches to unbind the spell portal. Or you can drop in with Scions, right? Because if, you, if, you're, if you're going first, uh, you know you can go first, for example, if you have a battle regiment and they don't. You can leave your Knight and Cantor in reserve and then just drop him wherever he needs to be so that he's 30, within 30 inches of Kairos. You give up a spell that way, but then you're guaranteed to get within range of the Dispel Scroll. Um, if you can't deploy your units in Scions, there is a, a specific threat range that Kairos has. He can't teleport before casting the Spell Portal. The Spell Portal mm -hmm. has to be set up within a certain range of him for him to use it. And it's, then the it's 36. It's so... The between the spell portal and his spell range being 18, if you are somehow placed your important targets outside of 36, they can't be targeted. That's right. Yeah. So if you, for example, are playing Stormcast, you can deploy Longstrike Raptors out of that range and then translocate into it for a Thunderbolt volley. 
uh, failing all that. So if you can't, if you can't, you know, be out of range of it, um, then what you can do at the very least, it's only going to do six mortal wounds, right? What you can do is you can set up a unit next to your shooting unit, like a melee unit, that can kill the chaos spawn immediately the turn that it spawns. This way your, your raptors won't be tied down. They might take some damage, uh, but they won't be tied down and they might not lose any additional after the six mortal wounds. And as a last resort, of course, just put your dudes in scions. Dark Master, Gift of Change, none of these things work if you're not on the table. And once Kairos is down, there is nothing in this army left that can threaten your shooting, which means that over the next four rounds, if you manage to kill Kairos in the first round, over the next four rounds, you control the board. Wherever you want to go, you can, because you can shoot everything out of the way in order to get there. Now, I would say, yeah. I would say the Demon Prince is the second highest priority. He can be very durable, mm -hmm. uh, but if you kill him, the entire army loses its ward, usually, if he's the general. Uh, but it also loses Blood Slick Ground, so you can just charge freely. So you've taken mm -hmm. the biggest control and durability piece off the table. Uh, as I mentioned before, Blood Slick Ground is activated in the hero phase, and it affects units within 18 inches at the time that it's used. Again, that's an, check with the TO, see how they want to play it. Um, but if you're playing it this way that I'm discussing here, uh, just don't leave your hammer units wholly within 18 inches of the Demon Prince at the end of your turn, and you should be fine, because he has to activate it in his own turn. Mm -hmm. So with Kairos and Demon Prince, whichever one you can kill is a good thing, right? Because you have a an Unbind Scroll, you can cancel out one Gift of Change or one Spell Portal per game guaranteed. Uh, mm -hmm. That means if you, for example, declare... You can do some sneaky stuff. You can declare uh, Bring It Down, which is to kill a monster... Uh, as your battle tactic, and your opponent might think, oh, he's going to try to go for Kairos. Okay, I'm going to use their finest hour on Kairos. But now that he's dedicated that to doing it, uh, he might not think that he has to use Dark Master, in which case you can then pivot and just try to shoot down the Demon Prince instead. All right, so whichever one of these targets you can kill is the one you should kill. I did list them in, in terms of Kairos is number one, Demon Prince is number two, but in reality, it's whichever one your opponent allows you to kill. If your opponent says... I'm using Finest Hour on Kairos, you say, great, I'm going to kill the Demon Prince. Thanks for thanks for deciding for me. Mm -hmm. uh, because like I said, you do have the Dispel Scroll, so if Kairos is up for one more turn, it's probably not the biggest deal in the world. The, the worst case scenario is that your opponent double turns, right? Because I'm assuming in this situation, you, you definitely want to go first. Um, yeah. If your opponent I mean, double uh, turns... You, yeah. you want to try and avoid uh, Blood Slick Ground, basically. Yeah. That activates in their hero phase, so... If you're running like Annihilators or a Melee Hammer that you want to quickly get in their face, um, yeah, that's a good chance to do it. Yeah, a, a very powerful Alpha Strike is what you need against this army. Mm -hmm. um, Bellicor himself is actually not a huge threat. As, as I discussed, he is durable and he's fast, but he's not. he doesn't do that much damage. Like I'm, I, I, I've tanked him with Liberators before. He's not going to wipe out whole units at a time. Uh, it is risky trying to snipe him, like, like you said, Murgonk. If you try to kill him, he's just going to pass off wounds to the Horrors, and then those horrors are going to duplicate and become a bigger threat than they were before. So, yeah, generally not worth trying to snipe him. Uh, in a perfect scenario, yep. you can kill Bellicor before he uses Dark Master, uh, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't go for it. I think Kairos yeah, I, and Demon Prince. Are I don't much think I've ever. Player. Yeah, I don't think I've ever focused Bellicor down whenever I faced him. Like I've had a practice match against with uh, my Annihilator list. Um, yeah, I would say Kairos first, Demon Prince second, and then just use your Annihilators and hammer down all the lesser demons. Uh, Bellicor is like one problem on one objective, and you know you can just almost avoid him. I would say, and you'll he, be fine. Yeah, he's only five models on an objective. He is a monster, so he counts as five. But he's only yeah. five models, so you don't even have to fight him. You just run around him and, and let him waste his time fighting stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some specific good units to have in your army. Uh, the Lord Relictor, I think, is, a, is an auto-include in any Stormcast list, but against this list in particular, he's very good because it makes Translocation a 2+, plus, and you can re-roll it, which means you can translocate a unit forward for Thunderbolt Volley on the first turn, which is exactly the kind of Alpha Strike shooting that you need in order to uh, stop this kind of army. Now, it should be worth noting that Bellicor can use Dark Master to stop you from chanting prayers, but if he uses it to stop Translocation, he's not using it to stop the long strikes that are shooting. So that's yep. I would call that a win. If if he uses Dark Master on, on the Lord Relictor, that's fantastic. That's like the best thing. In my experience, happen. yeah. If your long strikes are on the board, that's what they'll lock down. Like they Every know time. coming. Yep. Yeah. Because they know they can use Oracle of Eternity and Blood Slick Ground to try to stop your, your melee hammer, but they yeah. don't have anything that can stop the long strikes except Dark Master. So they're going to use it on that. 
Uh, Knight and Cantor is another like must-have unit if you're trying to face this army uh, because you it, every Knight and Cantor you bring buys you an extra turn where Kairos can be alive and you're still going to win the game. If you lose your shooting unit before Kairos is dead, you're probably going to lose the game. And yep. given how how fragile our shooting units are, uh, even Judicators, I would say, are, I would still count them as fragile. Um, if you start losing models from that unit and you can't shoot anything, you're going to probably lose the game because you just won't be able to get onto objectives. So every Knight oh, yeah. and Cantor gives you another turn where Kairos is just doing nothing, uh, which is really good. And and as we talked about before, Belicor can't actually use Dark Master to stop you from unbinding because Dark Master is used at the start of your your turn, and you don't you don't unbind spells in your turn. You only unbind spells in Belicor's turn. So yeah, he can't use he can use it if you want to if he wants to use it on your Knight and Cantor. You say great, you go right ahead. I'm not going to stop you from from doing that. Um, it might be a it might be good sportsmanship to point out the interaction though. Uh, when facing this list, you you want something that can kill horrors in a single turn. So uh, we strongly recommend uh, using a block of four fulminators or six grand hammers or uh, ten retributors or fifteen crossbow judicators. Something that can just do <laughs> a lot of damage in a single turn because you don't want to leave horrors alive. Uh, if you if you leave them with 10 models left, they can start rallying, they can start um, doing all kinds of nasty stuff. They count as more models the more of them you kill. It's just a really bad idea to leave them alive. You want to kill them all in a single turn. And you don't want to get stuck fighting them for multiple rounds, because how you're going to win against this list is by killing something and declaring the space as your own. Right? You don't want to be contesting objectives against yeah. you know 15 to 20 horrors at a time. You want to be killing these things and taking the objective for yourself. Yep. The more and yeah, and that's what's really good about this list is, is like the more it ties you down, it actually plays really well into tying you down because the more it's contesting something, the better it gets at contesting that thing. Yeah, it's so. it's it's like uh, it's like arguing with an engineer. You know, it's like <laughs> well, <laughs> I always used to hear this expression: it, it, arguing with an engineer is like is like wrestling a pig. Eventually, you uh, you learn that he just likes it. <laughs> that's what pink yeah. horrors are, man. They're a pig in the mud. They just love it. Yeah, I will say though, in my experience, like this is personal, of course. Like annihilators, excellent pink killing uh, units. Oh yeah, yeah. Even with the plus one save uh, from the the banner, they just rip right through it, and three wounds for every hit that goes through. It's beautiful. Yeah, plus the charging mortal wounds and the drop down mortal wounds. Like yep. I've I've often just like charged into ten pinks with three annihilators and done like some like twenty seven to thirty damage in one go, and that's great. Yeah. Annihilators do really well against any kind of uh, castle setup or anything that uses multiple smaller heroes that have like five, six wounds each, like this kind of list. Uh, they don't mm -hmm. do great against the epitome because they got a ward against mortals, but uh, you could potentially just kill the pink scribes if you drop in a couple units of annihilators. Like That's great mm -hmm. value. I think crossbow adjudicators are really, really good in this kind of uh, scenario because they can wipe out horrors every turn. And they're very good at killing Bellicor uh, because they have high volume and they don't need Ren to do it. However, they don't have the range that you need to kill Kairos early, so it's kind of a trade-off. If you're if you're using crossbow adjudicators and you're expecting to play against Legion, just know that you're going to have to play a more of a midfield approach, and they might be able to just keep Kairos out of your range, and you might need to bring an extra dispel scroll, for example, to deal with that. Yep. Uh, and the last thing I want to note here is you don't want to waste your time fighting horrors that are near the general. Uh, the five what board is effectively 25 more wounds. And if you think about how many points you have to dedicate to deal 25 more wounds, it's, it's a lot. So focus on the squads of horrors that aren't near the general or try to kill the general first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, unlike Velikor, the general is not going to have like a bodyguard. So even with a five up ward, the demon prince is, I think, I want to say eight or nine wounds. He's eight um, wounds and a three-up save, so effectively yeah, twelve wounds with the ward. Yeah, you can kill him with long strikes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Uh, the Storm Drake Guard are also a really good unit against this matchup. They ignore spells on a four-up, which makes them functionally immune to the only damage that this list does, which is through Gift of Change. They are a three-plus yep. save monster, which is very hard for this list to cut through. The only units with good rend are Bellicor, and he's not like the punchiest. So if you have a squad of four yeah. Drakes, they're just not dying ever. It's going to be yeah. great. And if you put them in Hunters oh, yeah, in the Heartland... Mortal Wounds Plenty with the breath. Ooh. Oh, yeah. That Ooh, breath baby. goes through uh, Lookout Sir, and it just melts stuff. It's great. Yeah. Um, if you put them in Hunters of the Heartland, they can't be roared, which is one of the big defenses that the Legion of the First Prince leans on right now is, is canceling out command abilities. Um, mm -hmm. This list, these guys are fast. They can get on the objectives before the Pink Horrors. Each one of them counts as five models, so you're not sitting there fighting over attrition battles. 
And the if you bring a Knight Draconis with them, that, that double tap Mortal Wound Spike can just kill the Demon Prince outright, which is fantastic. Um, worth noting, discussing here, Dragged Into the Tempest, uh, after fighting, you roll a 2 plus to kill a horror. Uh, it is an instant kill ability, which means it doesn't activate split and split again, but that also means that that horror that you killed can be rallied back. So if you're using this ability, make sure you're wiping out the unit. Right? Don't use it on a fresh unit of horrors, because you're actually just going to help them. And unfortunately, with this ability, your opponent actually gets to pick which model is slain. So if he has one pink horror left and a bunch of blues, then uh, yeah, you're just going to be helping him long term. Now, with the Storm Drake Guard, it is worth noting that they are they were not listed in our uh, high damage output unit list. And that's for a reason, because Storm Drake Guard are not the punchiest Stormcast unit. I don't think that four guard have the capacity to wipe out the horrors reliably enough. They are going to do about 30, 40 damage tops, and that's not going to be enough to kill the horrors. They're going to be stuck in combat with them. Um, that's just from a math perspective. I haven't played Storm Drake Guard in, against this matchup in particular. They've only been out for a couple days now. Uh, but I just, looking at the numbers, I'm not seeing how uh, Storm Drake Guard are going to punch through the horrors. So, yeah, you... I, and that and that thing is like that two plus the killer horror, that's not even per model. If it was, like, I could see. You yeah, know, I, I could see a way. You do it once per unit of Storm Drake Guard, not once per Storm Drake Guard, which is disappointing. Yeah. So their damage is good. It's good enough, right? Uh, if you combo them with something that is high damage, like crossbow adjudicators, for example, you, that's a natural combo. You should do fine with that. Um, but if you bring storm drake guard and long strikes, you know that might not be the best damage output for killing horrors. Uh, guard of steel soul is an excellent unit to bring against this kind of list because they need to do those six mortal wounds with gift of change. And if you can ignore just one of them, which you are very likely to do when you are rolling five up wards. Uh, if you can just ignore one mortal wound, then you have an extra turn to deal with Kairos. It's like having a Dispel Scroll every single turn with a bit of randomness attached to it, right? Because if they're trying to kill your, your support heroes with Gift of Change yep. and you're just exactly. ignoring it every turn and healing it back, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So just big ups I, for My guards. opponents made this mistake, tried to snipe out my uh, Lord Relictor, and I'm like, okay. I, tried, I was playing a Guardist list, I was like, okay, I'll just save two of those. Okay, I'm not dead and you don't get a spawn. Yeah, and then I'll they, heal myself back with like a healing storm next turn. Yeah, they don't have the redundancy. Like they'll make the cast for the spell portal reliably, and they'll make the cast for gift of change reliably. But their max damage is six. So if you can deny just mm -hmm. one of that, your six wound heroes survive. That they've lost a whole turn doing nothing. Yep, it's effectively like doing nothing. Yep. Talk about some other units that are fun to use against this list. Um, the Lord Celestine on Star Drake. He's eighteen wounds and a three up save. That's that's one of our most durable single models. Um, and it's very hard for a Legion First Prince to take him down because they rely on Gift of Change, which six wounds doesn't do anything to an 18 wound monster, really. It's like a tickle, especially if you have a ward from uh, Amulet of Destiny or Gardas. And then you could save stack for days and then you just ignore all the damage they do in their list. They don't do a lot of mortal wounds aside from Gift of Change. Uh, Reign of Stars is an excellent shooting ability to help finish off Kairos if you weaken him with some long strikes or some Judicators that got in range. Another... You know, four shots at Ren 3 can do a lot to help finish him off. And the Cavernous Jaws instantly kills horrors. Um, and in particular, unlike the Storm Drake Guard, which have all these terrible limitations, the Cavernous Jaws are fantastic because they can target specific models, which means you can kill the unit leader and you can kill the musician, which is giving the unit plus one save. Um, and then uh, that doesn't even get bracketed until you take nine wounds. So even if you get hit by a Gift of Change, even if you take some Unleash Hell damage on the way in, you're still going to be able to Cavernous Draws three guys reliably. It's brutal. And then just to top it all off, you're also a minus one to cast for enemies within 18 inches. So for a list that's relying on good wizards, this could be enough of a disruption for them. Mm -hmm. Another fun unit to use is Karazai. Uh, like the Star Drake, he's very durable. 18 wounds, 3 up save. Uh, he can't get the Amulet of Destiny, but he can have a pet Gardas sitting near him. Uh, but the reason you want to use Karazai here is uh, the Calamitous Tail is absurdly strong oh, yeah. against horrors. Yep. Uh, yep. Just get a, like 40 attacks off of it or something. Yeah, if they bring a reinforced unit of horrors, like if that becomes the way people play this list, I think Karazai is going to start seeing a lot of play. Um, re the reason for Karazai rather than Krondis in particular is because uh, the magic from Krondis is going to get shut down for the most part, and Karazai yep. just has way stronger single target damage. Like if Karazai gets into melee with a Demon Prince, that Demon Prince is dead. If he gets yep. into melee with Kairos, Kairos is dead. If he gets into melee with horrors, those horrors are dead. Karazai will kill anything in this list by himself, which is amazing. 
it's a it's a great use of 600 points and every time he kills one of these like weak little support heroes like the blue scribes he gets more attacks which makes him an even bigger threat so if you can this this guy has the potential to roll through the enemy army it's fantastic Celestin Prime is another good model to use against this army uh, because he can't be targeted by Dark Master, and then he gets a guaranteed 12-inch charge to finish off Kairos. And I do yep. mean guaranteed because the Celestin Prime's ability, uh, the Orrery of Celestial Fates, it says instead of making the roll, which means that can't be modified by Oracle of Destiny, which replaces a roll after it's already roll been done. Dice. Yes. Yep. Since the dice were never rolled, Oracle of Destiny can't be used. So Celestin Prime just comes down and hits something, and there's nothing that your opponent can do to stop it. And also, like always, he drops a meteor every turn, which is punishing armies that have uh, these small units and heroes lingering around. So even a, a turn one Celestin Prime might be worthy of a consideration if the meta uh, really favors this kind of list. I think there's a lot of good matchups for, for Celestin Prime right now. I mean, if, if GW looks into, like, uh, you know, uh, turning down all these shooting and making the game slower, then yeah, Celestin Prime really can shine, in my opinion. And uh, finally... The unit we've been talking about this whole time, but haven't specifically gotten to. Uh, Longstrike Raptors are the silver bullet to dealing with this list. As we mentioned before, the top priority is Kairos, and Longstrike Raptors have everything you need to deal with Kairos. They have super long range, they have Ren 2 to deal with armor stacking, and they have Thunderbolt Volley to shoot twice. You can like almost always get a translocation into a volley off on Kairos because he's such a big model, it's difficult for him to hide behind terrain. And you can deploy really far back and then just teleport forwards. And if you look at the math breakdown here, uh, running this through Stats Hammer, you can see that you'll need about 24 long strike shots to kill Kairos in one turn. So that is exactly enough damage with just six Raptors and Thunderbolt Folly. Oh, yeah. Yep. Just, uh, just a hair above, I would say. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. On average, Thunderbolt Volley will do eight damage because you can't use all out attack and your opponent can't use all the defense in the hero phase. And in, mm -hmm. in shooting phase, assuming both players use both, which seems to be the right decision, um, the shooting phase, you'll deal another eight or nine damage. So on average, you'll deal about 16 damage. Now, that can be modified, obviously, by Dark Master going off. That can be modified by any kind of hit debuffs if you're trying to shoot the Demon Prince instead. Um, yeah. If you're using Scions to avoid Dark Master, just make sure you have enough other shooting and other damage on the table to finish off Kairos or bracket him so heavily that Gift of Change is no longer a concern. Um, the mm -hmm. long strikes are super fragile. Like on average, they will kill Kairos, but be wary of low rolls. So make sure you have a backup plan. Are there any other units you guys can think of that would do really well against this kind of list? Mm, I want to say no. I think long strikes really are the silver bullet, unless you're just like spamming cross adjudicators or you know bow adjudicators. Um, yeah, I think. Kairos needs to die. This list in general is weak to range damage. When I think of range damage, you know, um, I can like uh, you already mentioned Storm Dragar, but I'm like, yeah, maybe the Dragon Spam list can just like move up the board and just try to breath Kairos down, you know? Yeah, the the but, all Dragon list. player, yeah, but a good player will try and deploy in such a way that you can't really get the Kairos with the Dragon Breath turn one. So yeah, the, you won't be able to get to him. But since the dragons are basically immune to spells. If you fully surround yeah. your opponent, they don't have any mobility to get out of there. Yeah. So I, I can they, they, like their main damage, like you said, is coming from Kairos, and once you lock that down, uh, like even the corn, uh, like because uh, even the corn uh, demon prince's ability is not going to matter because a lot of your damage is coming from the breath. So. Yeah, and you get to them before he activates the ability, even right. Like so, even mm -hmm. assuming it's an aura, right? You're you're just going to be there in his face turn one before he has a chance to activate it. So it'll be irrelevant. So Stormcast have a lot of great tools to to deal with this kind of list. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about before we before we close things off here is the impact of the new Nurgle Battle Tome and how we think, based on our first impressions, how that could impact this kind of list. Um, personally, I don't see it being a big difference. Uh, Plague Bearers are arguably worse for purpose in this list now because they don't have their 5-up ward all the time. They are more wounds, but what this list needed isn't more wounds necessarily because Pink Horrors are all the wounds you need, and more. So Plague, plague Bearers are arguably are worse. Um, I think Blight Lords might be a worthy consideration because they do have that uh, that Deep Strike ability if you bring a Lord of Afflictions. So that could mm -hmm. be an interesting twist. Give this list something it doesn't have right now, which is the ability to set up reserve units. Uh, it is a really expensive combo to do that, so I don't know if that'll make the cut. Also, because... yeah, I don't think it's worth it because the main reason you bring Pasquale Blight Lords in the new Nurgle book is because... 
their allegiance ability gives them a five up ward. But if you're just taking these guys and deep striking these in your opponent's face without the even Prince Holy with an eight to support them, like they'll just get torn apart. Yeah, and without the disease to deal extra mortal wounds, their their damage is even lower than it would be in a Nurgle army. And, mm -hmm. and Nurgle's not exactly a high damage army to begin with. Yeah. And it's like, uh, it's sort of it's counterintuitive to how this list wants to play. Like, it wants to just march up the board and slowly use its control elements to win the game. You know, the whole, like, alpha deep strike play style, I, I don't think that'll take off. No, I, it, like I said, the reason to use it is because it would give this list something it's currently lacking. But I don't mm. think it needs that. Like, just because it's lacking, it doesn't mean you need to have it, right? You don't need yeah. necessarily a well-rounded list. Like, some armies benefit from being well-rounded and some just don't care. They're all in on whatever they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, would Great Unclean Ones ever make the cut in a Legion of the First Prince army? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, so, you have we, to, so if, I haven't seen the full War Scroll because I haven't seen the full book, only like reviews of it. I'll have to go look at it again. But if they did move the 5 up board to an Allegiance ability, and it's not on the War Scroll, would you consider it? Like Maybe, I, I yeah, I because it... The Great Unclean One could be the general, in which case he, oh, sure. he gets the five up board anyway. I, I sure. don't know if the points um, would shake out well for that, but it, it's yeah, it's because an option. Great Unclean Ones are expensive now. They used to be I would say three twenty. They're like something like four eighty, and this list is already like pretty star for points. Like Belakor is like what three sixty, three eighty. Yeah, Paris is four twenty. The Demon Prince is I, I want to say one eighty or something like that, one ninety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's so a tight list already. Plus, are 220, so it's like you, you start losing out on points pretty quick. Yeah. The benefits of using the Great Unclean one uh, would be that he can now summon in Plague Bearers every turn, which is interesting uh, anti-shooting tech. Like, if the game starts moving towards shooting, which is what naturally counters this list, the Great Unclean one adding more units of Plague Bearers every single turn becomes just a bigger pain in the butt. Like, it doubles down on what this list is doing, which is, mm -hmm. which is really annoying. Um, in terms of damage output and spells, I'm not seeing a Great Unclean one being worth its points. But it does have a huge base, right? So that's a big ward aura. Think of it like the Bloodthirster, but instead of being this like almost stupid unit that runs forward and dies every time, it, it just sits back with the army and moves up with it. I, I think it fits into it better than a Bloodthirster would, but part of the reason Bloodthirster is used because it's cheap. It's not a very expensive monster. It's definitely not 500 points like a Great Unclean one. Those things are crazy expensive now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I, from first impression, it doesn't seem like the Nurgle Balaton would have too big of an impact on this army, but I'm not I'm not a Nurgle expert by any means. I'm just going off my impressions. Yeah, it's because like like okay, so this army's like main thing is yeah, slow moving control. So it really just comes down to how good the War Scrolls are on their own. So if the War Scrolls are particularly good somewhere, now what the thing to look out for is uh, obviously like all these new Chaos books are going to get revamped in the uh, coming years or coming months. You know, especially like Corn and uh, Corn and Slanesh, well, they just got a new book, so they, them not, but like Zinch will probably get a new one. And then, then, then it'll be interesting to see whether Corn makes the cut because blood letters have to be turned into these damage monsters. And maybe this list will finally start switching to some blood letters just to do damage. Yeah, the, the Disciples of Zinch book, if they get updated, that has the biggest potential impact on this army. Because it leans mm -hmm. so heavily on Kairos right now that if they reduce Kairos's capacity to do anything that he does in this list, if they revamp the battle tome, then this list really suffers. Um, it, it's it's leaning on him hard. If he doesn't make those gift of change every turn, you're struggling to do any meaningful damage. Well, the other thing that potentially could happen is, uh, and it's been talked about, but uh, talk about raising points on Kairos specifically in this uh, list's pitch battle profile. Yeah, this army needs its own pitch battle profiles. It it, sh it can't keep just picking and choosing the best and most efficient units from every faction table. It needs to be like the uh, Zangor Enlightened, which have different points, and Zinch and different points of Beasts of Chaos. This army mm -hmm. needs its own faction table, for sure. Or like the Terrorgeist and like Grisselgore and not Grisselgore. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. James, have you uh, had a chance to play against this list yet? Almost had the opportunity to this past week, but I had a withdrawal from the tournament that I was going to play, so... Yeah. It's unfortunate. It, it's very similar to like a lot of Soul Blight lists that you play. I think this uh, this list does that that concept of just tar pitting your opponent until you win. It, it do, this list does it the best in the game right now. I think I don't think there's anybody that does tar pits better than this. Maybe the new Nurgle book uh, might do it better because those three wound plague bearers are just stupid. <laughs> it's such a stupid unit. Nurgle was pretty uh, durable before, man. I'd hate to see it now. Well, they're also highly far more elite than they used to be. So 
it's sort of a trade-off. So yeah, yeah, we'll we'll see how that one shakes out. I'm sure we can do a whole live stream about that one. That would be a good topic. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. All right. So hopefully this video has helped you guys understand what Bellacor and the Legion of the First Prince are all about, uh, what their specific strengths are, what their specific weaknesses are. I didn't go into any particular list building because I wanted this to be evergreen. I wanted it to be, uh, even if you know points change next week, I want people to still come back and say, oh, these are the ideas behind how to counter this list. Uh, I'm going to think of it for myself because there's too many variables to consider. Um, like if you bring a list to just beat this army at a friendly game, you're, you're kind of a jerk. Uh, I'm talking about in a tournament setting, you want to bring an army that can handle this list and other things as well, right? So you kind of put all these pieces together. How do I beat this? How do I beat that? And you kind of balance it all together, and that's how you should form a list around it. Um, I mean, if you want to build a list to beat this army, you can. Just bring, like, nine Vanguard Raptors, and you'll just kill Kairos every single time. There's no doubt about that. So wrapping it up, uh, let's talk about our upcoming videos. This Friday, uh, if you're watching this on the week of December, whenever we record this, uh, we have our next live stream coming up with the AOS Coach on December 17th at 8 p.m. Eastern. The topic of the live stream will be how to collect a Stormcast army. We've gotten a lot of requests from people uh, asking us to discuss this topic, things like, I got the Dominion box, what should I get next? Or what trap units should I avoid because they're really bad and you know, Games Workshop doesn't tell us this kind of information. Uh, so we're gonna be talking all about that with our friend, the AOS coach, live on, uh, on YouTube. So feel free to tune in for that. Uh, in terms of podcast episodes, we are working on Stormcast as coalition units in Cities of Sigmar, and we are working on a tier list update that will be released after the Winter 2021 update, and another Lords of the Storm, which is our list building uh, series that we do, and that will also be after the 2021 update. Uh, James, you want to fill people in on the hobby hangouts? Yeah, so we're still doing our regular hobby hangouts uh, three times a week. So one day is uh, 7 to 10 for the North American crowd, Saturday is 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern for the European crowd, and 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern for uh, the Australian crowd. Uh, I did want to say we're probably going to wind this down for the month of December, considering that we're going into the holidays, and we'll go back into full gear again in January. Right on. I am happy to announce we're going to have our first painting contest. It's going to be the Night Relic Tour. Uh, submissions are <laughs> <laughs> the best model in the book. I mean, have you guys yes. seen his mace? His mace, yes. Three, three damage baby. attacks. Oof. Friend one. Three attacks, baby. How do you beat that? Uh, mm. So we're, we're mostly just using it as an excuse to paint this model that we're never going to put on the table, probably. <laughs> just wait. Just wait until that winter update. You're going to eat those words. I hope I do, because I would love to use this model. I, that would mean he's good enough to make it into one of my lists. That would be great. Uh, so submissions for this are going to be open on our Discord from December 26th until January 16th, which is a nice, beefy three-week period. So if you've got stuff to do before the holidays, you can start painting them now. You don't have to get the model on December 26th. Uh, we figured we should do it on a model that is new and people probably don't have painted yet <laughs> because of all the negative talk we've given about the model. I don't think it's been a high priority for a lot of people. Uh, first place will be judged by the three of us, and we will give the winner a choice of uh, Vanquishers, Vindictors, Vigilors, and I think I'm going to add Annihilators onto the list as well. They're about all about that same. Uh, I think we got a errata. We got a errata the side here. You say ten Vigilors, and then just Vanquishers, Vindictors. Yeah, I don't know all ten. Yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll issue uh, an errata in the winter. I promise. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Totally. Um, yeah, and Battle Reports, uh, we're still working on it, and we hope to release the first one after Christmas sometime. If you guys tuned into our first live stream uh, a couple weeks back, you will hear everything about uh, how we're envisioning them and how we want them to turn out. Uh, so if you want to help us work on that, consider supporting us on Patreon. We're patreon.com slash thestormkeep. Uh, we're still looking for feedback on patron rewards. We want to know what you guys think is worth your time. We want to make sure that uh, if you're willing to throw down a couple bucks, we want to make sure it's worth something besides buyer's remorse. Uh, one of the things we have added recently is uh, a new reward for Justicar tier supporters, which are tournament reports from us. When we go to tournaments, we're going to write up our thoughts, talk about each matchup, and we're going to post them up there for you guys to read. I swear to God, I'm going to finish the one from last month tomorrow, guys. <laughs> we'll get there, man. We'll get there. Uh, yes, thanks to all our supporters. Uh, you guys really make this uh, little rant we have for a few minutes possible. Uh, thanks to Champasaur, Sleepa, Marcus Pfefferkorn, Ryan Jones, Nick Riley, Pavel Raman, Marcus LT, Spartan 12006, Andre Menendez, Red Rum Mage, Lens Take, Colleague, Grogs, Hot Bear, Bilko, Butterfrogs, Rending, Combat, Tim Anderson, 
Nekarit, Nick Barber, Dignica, Jack Geiger, Jace, Key Betson on Griff Charger, Standwise, Reaper Time, Freyda, Mark Knight, Dungeon Master, Blood Clot Plots, James Nussbaum, Modnar, Echo Papa, and Party Raptor. That's a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. How'd you get it's almost like a rap at this point. It's we like should a, turn it into uh, like a poker rap. Like what? Uh, yeah, I know. I was going to say that. It's like, that. it's like that Pokemon rap at the end of Pokemon. Champs or sleep, uh, Marcus Peppercorn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Hopefully you uh, found this video useful. Uh, if you do, then do the things that the algorithm likes for you to do. Do the, the YouTube things. Yeah. See you in the next one. See you next time.